You're welcome, Gabriel. <laughs> Glad you can make it. Okay, I think we're going to get ready to go in a minute. Um, let's see, can wait for a couple more people to join join us. Hello, Mr. Blittersdorf. He says hello to you, Jim. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nicole Smith, I'm Director of Library and Archives at the York County History Center. If you have any questions during our program, please type them in the chat or in comments if you're on Facebook and we'll take a look at those after the program. This webinar is being live streamed um, on the History Center Facebook page and recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Let me just share my screen for a minute. Okay, I'd like to announce that we have a new virtual exhibit on the York County History Center webpage entitled Energy Awaits, the Smith Putnam Wind Turbine and the Beginning of Wind Energy in America. We'd like to thank the Blittersdorf Family Foundation for sponsoring the exhibit, as well as the inventory and rehousing of the Smith Putnam Wind Turbine Archival Collection at the York County History Center. Our collection contains hundreds of records and photographs related to the development of the wind turbine. We also have our most recent journal of York County history, or York County heritage, pardon me, which is available now in our gift shop and online. It has an article uh, by Stephen Nicholas entitled The True Profit of Wind Power, Beecham Smith's Pioneering Effort in Alternative Energy. And for more information about our programs and webinars, please visit our website which is yorkhistorycenter.org. And now I would like to introduce our speaker. James F. Manuel is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the founding director of the university's Wind Energy Center. Professor Manuel has been working in the field of wind energy for more than 35 years both within the United States and internationally. He was a contributing author to the book, Wind Diesel Systems, a guide to, to the technology and its implementation, and an author of the textbook, Wind Energy Explained, Theory Designed and Application, and numerous other publications on various aspects of wind energy. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Manuel. Thank you. Oh, we can't hear you, sir. You'll have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that nice introduction. Uh, if you can hold on just a sec, oh, I'm going to sh share my screen, I hope. 
Are you sure? Yes. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I want to say thank you again very, very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, to speak about the, the Smith Putnam wind turbine. Um, I became interested in this uh, uh, kind of at the beginning of my career at Wind Energy when we used the book that uh, PC Putnam wrote about that project as, as our textbook because there weren't any other textbooks available at the time. So I'm going to just show some slides here. Is I hope I'm going to show some slides. Yes. Um, so um, as, as she said, I'm talking about the Smith Putnam wind turbine and the design, the development and uh, the legacy. So here's, if, for those of you who haven't seen it before, there's, uh, there's a picture. Uh, this was from our files. My, my professor at the time, uh, Dwayne Cromack, uh, gave me this picture uh, some time ago. So this is gives a, a, a sort of a general overview of what it looks like. Um, so the key facts about this turbine, as at the, at the time uh, that it was installed, it was the largest wind turbine ever built uh, uh, anywhere in the world uh, when it was in, installed in Vermont. Uh, its diameter was 175 feet and its power rating was uh, 1.25 megawatts. Uh, as far as we can tell, it was the world's first uh, grid connected wind turbine. It, uh, as you'll see later that we're not 100% sure that's true, but it probably was. Uh, and the intent was to generate electricity at, at competitive rates. And it was, it, was a pro it was a project of the S. Morgan Smith Company of York, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, which was a, a major producer of uh, hydroelectric turbines at the time. And I think they wanted to, to expand from hydro into wind. They had some very interesting ideas early on as to how they could use uh, wind turbines in conjunction with uh, uh, hydroelectric plants where the hydro plants would essentially uh, serve as storage or the wind turbine you could, uh, as they viewed it as one way to sort of artificially create more water. Uh, by using less water when the turbine uh, was operated. Uh, the whole project itself lasted from roughly 1935 when people first thought about it until 1948. And I'll explain as we go uh, what happened to various um, steps along, along the process. So uh, the basic uh, configuration of this turbine uh, is, became rather significant later on. And, and I'll talk about what happened after the project uh, was over and, and kind of the legacy of that turbine uh, in, into the modern age. But it, it was uh, unique from uh, what you'd think about turbines today and that had uh, two blades and the rotor itself, the blades that is to say, uh, uh, were downwind of the tower. That means if the wind is blowing uh, towards the turbine, it, it goes uh, by the tower before it goes to the blades. Um, so most turbines today aren't like that. Um, and the blades, uh, blades were hinged at the hub, uh, a very unusual uh, configuration, uh, both before and since. Uh, a, a really interesting idea, I, I have to say, although it hasn't been used very much since then. Uh, it had a synchronous generator, which means it's directly uh, connected uh, to the utility in a way that uh, is not that easy, but it, it worked uh, for them. Um, uh, uh, reasonably well, uh, and it was a type of generator that would have been used in hydro plants uh, at the time. Uh, uh, the governor uh, that controlled the speed, which you have to have on a, on a device such as this, was essentially a modification of a, a, a hydro, uh, hydroelectric uh, governor as well. Um, it, was, it was fairly innovative in its concept, and uh, in some ways it it was similar to what is used today. Uh, the, the, the details of today's controllers are, are different, of course, but what the principle was very similar. Uh, it had steel blades, which was uh, kind of amazing in the context of today's turbines. Uh, no, no turbines have steel blades, uh, but this one did. Uh, and it was on a steel truss tower. Uh, it was a very heavy machine. Uh, so the next few slides gonna illustrate what the what the designers were thinking of uh, as they as they planned this uh, planned this turbine, uh, and the first was uh, making electricity with the wind in the first place. Uh, as far as we can tell, uh, the the inventor, at least in the United States, was a fellow named Charles Brush, uh, made electric generating wind turbine back in uh, Cleveland, 
1888, and it looked a lot like American water pumpers, uh, but it was not connected to the utility grid. It just made uh, DC electricity uh, that's which could be used to charge a battery, et cetera. Uh, meanwhile, in Denmark, uh, years before the Smith-Putnam turbine, uh, a fellow named Paul Lacour was doing some pretty interesting things at the same time, also making electricity not grid connected, uh, but he was producing hydrogen uh, via electrolysis of water. And uh, this is, could be called the forerunner of, of the Danish concept, which we'll talk a, a little bit uh, more about later on. Uh, and I, we know for sure that uh, Putnam looked at this turbine, or at least uh, from a distance, the, the so-called Yalta wind turbine. It was one of the first, what was then considered large electricity uh, electricity generating wind turbines uh, built at Yalta in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Uh, 100 kilowatts, which by today's standards is quite small, but by the standards of the 1930s, it, it was still quite large. And it may, or, it may have been the first to be grid connected. That's what I say about the Smith Putnam turbine. I can't, haven't been able to ascertain whether this was grid connected at all. It didn't operate for very long. Uh, it's hard to find information out about it. Uh, another thing, idea they looked at was something called the Flettner rotor, a very unusual configuration uh, where you have uh, spinning rotors, as you see here on this ship. And by virtue of their spinning, uh, they generate lift. They act like an airfoil or a sail. And it, you could call it kind of pseudo sails. And they helped the, uh, this ship uh, cross the Atlantic in 1925. Um, but there were, there were reasons that uh, uh, Putnam rejected this design and they probably made a lot of sense. Uh, there were some other configurations of this rotor actually built in the United States, uh, but they did not, uh, it did not last very long. Um, also in the 1930s, uh, electricity in rural areas became, uh, became quite, um, or small wind turbines became uh, quite widely used. Uh, this is one uh, due to a fellow named uh, Jacobs. Actually, there were two brothers, uh, the Jacobs brothers, that made a lot of these uh, turbines uh, put up in farms uh, all, all over the country. Uh, again, relatively small. I mean, it's obviously larger than this person standing here, but compared to the Smith, Smith Putnam turbine, it was, it was quite small. Um, then there were some uh, visionary ideas, which uh, Putnam also considered. A fellow named Hernam Honef uh, out of Germany uh, had some amazing concepts uh, for very large uh, wind turbines. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, he uh, proposed multiple rotors. I believe this one on the right uh, was the one that uh, Putnam looked at most closely. Uh, it was going to be a 50 megawatt turbine, supposedly. Uh, this never got out of out of the visionary state uh, at all. And uh, Putnam had some pretty interesting things to say about it in, in his book about why he didn't follow that. But it seems to be a, a, a wise a wise decision, um, but it was still an interesting vision. So uh, moving on to the design and the fabrication installation of, of the turbine, uh, let's look at the, the design team. Uh, the, the main designer or the, or the project manager, I guess we could say, was um, uh, uh, Palmer Putnam, uh, a graduate of MIT, uh, engineering graduate from MIT, did a, a whole variety of projects, interesting activities over, over the course of his life and got quite interested in uh, wind energy early on, uh, according to some sources. Uh, because of his experiences on Cape Cod, where he noticed uh, that there was a lot of wind and said, well, why don't, and high electric bills, so why not, can't we make it more, the electricity more cheaply uh, with wind? So that was what got him excited. Uh, and somewhere along the line, he ran into uh, a George, uh, a, well, he ran into the S. Morgan Smith Company and uh, discovered that they were also interested in uh, wind energy and the idea of uh, making a wind turbine, as I said before, that could uh, that they could sell along with their hydro turbines. And their uh, uh, their chief engineer was a fellow named George uh, uh, Jessup, who I've been reminded by my colleague John McGowan here at UMass, also a professor, that uh, he's his wife is George Jessup's cousin. As I understand it. So there's a connection uh, way back when. Who knew? Uh, 
another person, a very interesting person on the team was a fellow named Pedro von Karman, uh, who was an aer uh, aerodynamicist of, of uh, wide renown. Uh, his, uh, his name is still used today by students who study uh, uh, fluid mechanics. There's a, a, a von Karman's constant. Uh, is a, did a lot of work in fluid mechanics, aerodynamics uh, early in uh, uh, the uh, uh, 20th century. Uh, there were quite a few consultants from uh, uh, MIT uh, who were involved in various uh, uh, aspects of the design and evaluation of the design. Uh, and their names that you'd see today, Dan Hartog uh, was a, a professor who wrote a text that's uh, still used uh, by some people today on, on dynamics. Uh, a fellow named Wilbur became the, uh, the chief engineer and there are a number of others. I won't dwell too much on, on uh, exactly who did what, uh, but it is significant that there were a large number of academics involved uh, in this project. Because um, again, this what they were proposing to do uh, S. Morgan Smith and Putnam was to build something that was far larger than anything ever been built anywhere in the world. So it just wasn't just a little bit larger. It was it was much, much larger. Uh, and they figured, I, I guess they figured that uh, if they found the smartest people or the most experienced people uh, in the world in these various uh, relevant fields, they could uh, they could build a turbine that would it would work and, and be economically economically viable. Uh, and as, in addition to the design engineers and the design team and the, uh, the consultants, there there were a number of industrial partners. Uh, S. Morgan Smith, of course, that I've uh, referred to uh, previously, uh, and to their uh, president at the time, uh, uh, Beauchamp Smith. Uh, when, um, I should also mention along the line that S. Morgan Smith uh, uh, continued uh, in some form, and I think even continues today, not by name, it was bought by Alice Chalmers, and then uh, subsequently by a company uh, called uh, uh, Voth, uh, who I believe still make uh, turbines today. So at least aspects of that company still exist, but I don't believe in York. Um, the next, one of the next main partners was Central Vermont uh, a Public Service uh, a Corporation, uh, they were the utility that that agreed to be the host uh, of this wind turbine and allow the turbine uh, to be hooked into their into their network. Uh, American Bridge Company uh, was, I think, the uh, the chief fabricator of the turbine, and uh, they involved uh, they used worked together with a variety of other companies, Wellman Engineering, uh, General Electric uh, uh, supplied the generator. Uh, the governor was from Woodward Governor, a, a company with long experience in, uh, in uh, hydroelectric uh, governing and, and control systems. And uh, finally, the Bud Company, uh, I think was responsible for, uh, uh, for the blade, uh, uh, the blade skin, the, the outer layer of the blades. So uh, they're all uh, a, 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 a group on, on both sides, a, a very experienced uh, on the industrial side, as well as on, uh, on the academic side, uh, the design side. So uh, if anybody could do it, uh, this, this team was probably as qualified as any you could find in the world. So in terms of the design, uh, I, I gave a brief summary um, in one of the earlier slides uh, of what they ended up with. But what they did was, is they reviewed this earlier experience, just as I did in these, in these slides beforehand. Uh, and but they decided early on that uh, that that they needed to be a, a grid connected in order for this to be a really economic venture, um, and it would it needed to be large enough to have uh, uh, economic uh, potential. That was kind of one of the keys. They didn't. They weren't just interested in remote power. They wanted to be uh, a grid connected and have a chance uh, of being uh, competitive with, with other other sources of electricity. And so the basic concept, as I said, is, uh, is, is they focus on two blades uh, for reasons that are a little surprising. They, they did conclude that they couldn't have gotten much more, much more power uh, from the three blades, which is true, um, but they might have saved them some design headaches if they had gone with three blades, it turns out. Uh, they had a downwind rotor. Uh, again, they thought this was advantageous. They realized that the, that the force, the wind would tend to uh, bend the blades. If the, if the uh, blades were upwind, they could bend into the tower. If it's downwind, they could uh, bend away. And in fact, they, they designed the, 
uh, the hub in such a way that it could bend a lot. Uh, it was not, they were on hinges, so they could, there, there was a lot of flexibility there. Uh, wind turbine rotors inherently turn smoothly, uh, turn slowly, uh, and uh, uh, generators would prefer to turn uh, rapidly, relatively speaking. And so you need a gearbox uh, uh, for speed up between the, the wind turbine's rotor and the gearbox. And so they, they had a gearbox there. I mentioned the blades were hinged at the root. Uh, I've got two gearboxes there, but it had an active yaw, uh, which means that it could uh, follow the wind uh, with a yaw drive, uh, but also because it was downwind, it would tend to go where um, the wind wanted it to go. You could you could say that, but they uh, they they included an active yaw as a way to make sure that it went where it wanted. Uh, the blades uh, angles could be. Uh, could be changed. That's to say varying the pitch of the blade uh, that facilitates did startup and also uh, would limit the power in very high winds. You don't want to have uh, the turbine produce too much power uh, in high winds because it could burn out the generator and overstress various of the components. So that was a, a pretty interesting um, a system that they used for that. Um, that was adapted from hydroelectric controllers. Uh, they used steel blades, as I mentioned before, with a stainless steel skin, uh, which I guess would have made it very shiny. Uh, uh, I don't know if they thought about the appearance, but, uh, but that's what they used. They used stainless steel. Uh, the blades were not, uh, they were not uh, uh, twisted as modern blades are and not tapered. They had a kind of uniform, uh, 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 shape to them uh, all along their length. So that's, and they had a variety of reasons for, for all of this. And you know, they were basically uh, reasonable, reasonable reasons, I think. So in the next few slides uh, illustrate uh, some of the fabrication uh, that went on. You, you, in this case, you're looking along the, along the blade. Uh, if you look inside, it has an internal structure uh, that um, that that prevents uh, the the blade from bending too much uh, or or breaking. It, it gives it strength. It's kind of like a girder uh, uh, inside the blade, uh, but then it has an overall shape that's uh, that's uh, uh, provided by uh, uh, by by steel, essentially a steel frame uh, inside. Uh, the skin, and then this outer skin provided an aerodynamic surface that, uh, like an airplane uh, wing, essentially, that would provide uh, lift. The lift force would go in the right uh, direction uh, in order to um, uh, in order to to provide the motive uh, force to, uh, to to turn the rotor. Um, <clears throat> And so you can see in this framework, this is all being assembled here uh, as a blade. I mean, once the blade, it's the, the two blades were assembled, then they were they were pre-assembled uh, uh, to the hub that they were using. As you can see, this this whole area, this whole section in here, uh, is is the hub, and there were hinges, uh, and the whole that the, the, the uh, each hinged area could bend could bend this way. Uh, and it was controlled by a uh, uh, by mechanism that went th uh, through the center of the hub. And so they wanted to put this all together uh, before uh, they took it uh, uh, out out to the site uh, for for the installation um, uh, there. You know, just to you know, make sure everything was as uh, as unlikely to cause problems as as it could be. So here is a, um, an illustration of what the drivetrain uh, itself looked like, which would have been uh, in, a, um, in a, something like a house on, uh, uh, on top of the tower. Uh, so this was, was, uh, is, is the hub itself. Again, this is the model of, 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 the, of the turbine. Uh, this is the, the main shaft. It's a fairly large diameter to, to, take, to take the torque of the forces from uh, uh, the blades of, and uh, their weight as well, but you have a lot of torque associated with uh, with the generation. And I had a coupling. I didn't label that here, but there's a coupling there, uh, and then a gearbox, uh, and then a generator, uh, 
which would produce the, the electric uh, current that would then uh, uh, go down the, uh, the tower th through electrical cables. Uh, and the whole structure then here would be mounted on uh, top of the tower. So the, the, uh, as I said previously, uh, this uh, turbine uh, was intended to be installed in Vermont. Uh, there was quite an extensive project to uh, identify uh, a site. Uh, the idea really as a part of the whole project is they wanted, they wanted uh, a test site for the first turbine. And the idea was that uh, once they, they, they had built and tested the, this first turbine, they would, go, they would take their experience from, from, from those tests and go back to the drawing board and uh, uh, design a kind of a next stage uh, pre-commercial turbine. And then eventually that was intended to lead uh, to a commercial uh, scale turbines that would have been somewhat less expensive and somewhat lighter. And they would have been installed in groups uh, on the mountains, uh, the ridge tops of Vermont. Uh, and something that maybe is not so well known about this project is that the, there was a, a very detailed uh, campaign to uh, to study the winds and of of Vermont and and what they uh, and what people could expect there, uh, and including something that I always found quite fascinating is they is is they looked at the vegetation uh, uh, very carefully and were able to correlate the vegetation and how it was deformed. Uh, to the to the average wind speeds at the site, and they came up with a way based on those studies uh, to do uh, a prospecting uh, for for wind turbines that was actually used uh, up until probably 30 years ago uh, as a way to figure out at least as a first cut measure is this a windy spot or is it not a windy spot and. Uh, you know, if you thought, well, the, 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 the trees are really what's called flagged, they're all bent over, uh, that's good indication that it's, um, uh, that it's windy and worth looking at in more detail. So uh, kind of a, a side note to the project, but nonetheless turned out to be very, uh, a very interesting uh, experience. So uh, again, this was uh, near, in Vermont, uh, near Rutland, uh, in the service territory of uh, the Central Vermont uh, utility. So the next few slides just illustrate a, a couple, uh, uh, yeah, a couple illustrations of, of the installation uh, process. Uh, this uh, showing uh, the blades, uh, one of the blades at a time being being moved up uh, to uh, the top of Grandpa's knob. The story is that uh, when they identified this uh, uh, this this hill, it was a three thousand, uh, roughly three thousand uh, feet above sea level, uh, the summit. So it wasn't the highest in that area, but it was a reasonably high. And nobody really knew what the name was, uh, but uh, then somebody said, "Well, that was Grandpa's Grandpa's knob." He called it. Uh, that's what my grandpa called it. I guess the owner of the site, and uh, so that got that name, and the name stuck with it. Um, so obviously it was quite a project uh, to, to move these blades. Nobody had ever moved blades anywhere near this size before, uh, but they were able to, uh, to do that and uh, get, the, get the blades up there with a minimum of difficulty. Apparently they had one, one incident uh, going up the hill on one of the blades, but were able to, uh, 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 to recover from that fairly, fairly readily and, and get all the equipment up on, up on top of the mountain. So they, uh, they built a crane uh, uh, on the mountain. Uh, it's not the kind of crane you think of today with wheels and self-propelled. It, it appears to have been a permanent or semi-permanent crane uh, uh, erected for the specific purpose of helping to erect the, the turbine itself. So, so first they built the crane and then they built, uh, built the turbine. Uh, and so you can see here, there's various stages of that. Uh, this is, and the one on the right uh, shows the, uh, uh, the tower has already been, been assembled and uh, the whole upper part of the turbine, uh, which now we would call uh, the nacelle assembly, uh, is lifted up on top and it will be placed uh, right up here. And over here, you can see it's doing some, the crane is doing some work uh, on the nacelle 
uh, looks like getting ready to uh, install the blades. So just uh, as a way of as a footnote here, this is uh, not too different from how large uh, turbines uh, are installed uh, today. Although generally speaking, you don't uh, build a semi-permanent crane. You have something on wheels that can go to the site and then go to another location later on. So uh, they, they got it running. Uh, it was, uh, I believe that it, uh, the first operational date was October 19th, I think 1941. So 80, 80 years ago, uh, plus a few days uh, from today. So October is, uh, is a, uh, of 2021 and is a good time to have a, uh, an anniversary. Um, and it operated uh, as a, a test machine from uh, uh, 1941 to 1945 uh, uh, for a total of approximately a thousand hours. So it wasn't really intended to run uh, continuously and there were various issues that they encountered uh, that precluded uh, more operation uh, due to World War II uh, occurring at approximately the same time. Um, but there was a problem, uh, a, a serious, they had a couple of serious problems uh, during the course of the operation. One had to do with the bearing that needed to be replaced and one had to do with uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, some uh, problems at the blade root of uh, the skin, that stainless steel skin started to separate uh, and they took a good close look at, at, at the root of the blade and did some more analysis and decided that the stresses at the at the at the at the base of the blade were higher than they anticipated, and um, they thought, well, maybe we should get a new blade. But they really, or two new blades, uh, redesigned. But they couldn't do that uh, due to the war going on, and so they had to decide what to do: uh, whether to just stop and wait for the war to end, or to attempt to repair uh, by doing some welding. And uh, that's what they did, and. Uh, uh, the evidence is that they, the welding itself led to additional damage uh, in the steel, in particular in a location in the blade that was not uh, uh, visible due to the way the blade was manufactured. There are these essentially internal walls that, that, uh, that provided some of the structural strength to the blade, it's a series of these. Uh, and uh, they couldn't see that these uh, cracks uh, had were being had been caused uh, by the welding, or at least had been exacerbated by the welding, and then a continuous operation uh, caused the cracks to grow even more, uh, until uh, finally, uh, in uh, March of 1945, a blade came off, uh, which was obviously a pretty bad situation. Uh, uh, the stories are pretty uh, dramatic. Uh, there was this. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the engineers or the the test engineers um, or technicians uh, was in the uh, up in the turbine at the time uh, that the uh, that the blade came off, and uh, it it caused with the blade missing there was uh, quite an imbalance, and uh, so the turbine was lurching around, uh, but the fellow uh, who was up there uh, had the wherewithal and he was also heavy enough to. Uh, to lean on the brake. There was a brake that you could, that a person could activate, and he did activate the brake and uh, bring the whole turbine to a halt. Uh, and uh, they said that the blade, uh, the blade uh, landed about 750 feet from, uh, uh, from, from the towers. Uh, so that was a uh, kind of bad news, uh, obviously, for the project at that at that point, and uh, there was no operation uh, uh, that could uh, uh, could it could the could determine couldn't operate anymore after that. Um, so this, as you see, a, a clipping, a newspaper clipping uh, from that from that time. So so what happened uh, after that? Uh, so uh, it, this could have just ended everything. And uh, this, the turbine just could have been completely con I, I confined to history there, that ended then, but it, it didn't really end. So there were a number of studies that, that uh, went on uh, after the, the, uh, the turbine uh, failure. Uh, they did a kind of a thorough, thorough design review 
and it was determined that uh, that there was nothing fatally wrong with the design uh, in general, but there were some changes that that would be needed to go uh, to go further. Uh, however, uh, looking at the economics of the project uh, and what the new the next generation of this turbine would look like, they decided that uh, that the wind uh, uh, well, that the electricity couldn't compete uh, with other sources of electricity at that time. And so the project uh, was abandoned as at least uh, uh, on the experimental uh, side uh, uh, as a result of that. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, the president of S. Morgan Smith, Beauchamp Smith, requested that uh, Putnam uh, author a book uh, to describe the project, uh, which he did. And the book was published in, in 1948 as well. Uh, and then it was republished or reprinted uh, some years later. So that, that was the immediate aftermath. And again, that, that could have been the end of it. But uh, in fact, it really wasn't quite the end uh, of uh, at least uh, the vision and the ideas uh, and, and the lessons from, from the project. And, and so, uh, and it was never completely forgotten. And then in the 1970s, uh, at the time of the oil crisis, uh, a lot of people started looking at other alternatives, uh, uh, means, to, means to generate electricity that did not require coal or, or oil, nuclear, things like that. Uh, and so the US, uh, uh, yes, ERDA, Energy Research and Development Administration, uh, began some uh, wind energy uh, uh, research activities uh, that resulted in a series of wind turbines that are that are um, usually going to the uh, the name of the mod, mod series. Uh, and I'll show some pictures of those uh, those in a, in a in a few minutes. Um, as it turns out, uh, for various other kind of historical and practical reasons, that this basic configuration of the two bladed downwind turbine was uh, largely supplanted by what might be called the Danish wind turbine concept, which I alluded to, uh, to earlier. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but there were many aspects of the project design that have continued uh, in, in some form. And this is, uh, so it's turned out that people keep thinking about uh, the, uh, the kind of the implications of, of the Smith Putnam design and, uh, and, and should we go back to two blades again? Uh, should we go back, back to downwind um, uh, uh, rotors again? Uh, and what did we learn that we're still using? So uh, there's, a, there's a lot uh, still there. So I'm gonna show some slides on, on some of the successors and, and what um, sort of what happened next and, um, and say a little bit about how the Smith Putnam turbine fits into that. So first and foremost, sort of at, as, as you get into the 1950s, uh, the, uh, this design from Denmark continued to evolve. Uh, this, as I say, the, these came kind of evolutions of, of that turbine that Paul Lecour had developed in the 19, early 1900s. And they went through a series of iterations, still relatively small, uh, up through uh, something called the Gedzer Mill uh, in the, in the uh, mid 1950s. And this had many aspects which have become common today. There was a three-bladed turbine rather than two. Uh, the rotor uh, was upwind of the tower. This had guide blades uh, that gave it extra strength to help the, help the, help the turbine and make sure that the blades didn't come off. Uh, it's kind of the belt and suspenders approach, some people say. Uh, that's not used anymore. Uh, it did have a horizontal axis, just like the uh, Smith Putnam turbine did. Although I didn't mention this before, that this, the uh, Smith Putnam turbine's axis was actually actually tilted somewhat. There, there are reasons for that. I, I won't go into the details unless somebody asks about it. Uh, and many turbines today actually have their main axis tilted somewhat as well. Uh, not exactly in the same reason that the Smith Putnam did, but for kind of their own engineering reasons, we'll say. Uh, it was. It did not have pitch control. Uh, this turbine. It had what's called stall control, uh, which is a whole different way of doing things. It, it has some advantages in uh, apparent simplification, but it also has uh, some disadvantages. And in fact, this has been supplanted uh, by uh, um, blade uh, by changing the blade pitch as as was used on the Smith Putnam turbine. So that's one of the areas where it's. Uh, 
uh, it's uh, a legacy has definitely uh, continued. Uh, it's uh, a generator was uh, was of a different type and in many ways it was simpler uh, to uh, uh, connect to the utility network uh, at, at least early on it, it it is simpler, uh, although to do it right in the way that people do it now, they, they add some layers of sophistication to make uh, the connection a little bit smoother. And it was connected to the grid, uh, the, this turbine. So that, so that was a lot that was learned from, from this turbine. And as I say, the, the Danes the Danes like to claim that they, they invented modern wind turbines, turbines starting from this one. And that, that's sort of true, but not quite. Uh, at the same time, roughly the same time, uh, a fellow named Ulrich Hütter, uh, an aerodynamicist at the University of Stuttgart in Germany, was doing a lot of experimental work with uh, uh, very lightweight designs, composite blades. Uh, this was a two-bladed uh, turbine as well. It had a lot of success. He, did a, he built these in a variety of configurations uh, that were used over a number of years. Uh, at UMass, uh, there was also a lot of work done in, in these days, uh, looking at uh, what could become the next generation of turbines. This is a, another three-bladed design. It was done when it had tapered, twisted composite blades. It was pitch regulated, uh, variable speed and computer controlled. Uh, and it, it became, it was most significant probably because it became the forerunner of the first uh, wind farm turbines in the United States that uh, developed by a company called U.S. Wind Power that was a, a spinoff from, uh, from UMass in those days. So uh, a couple slides here on what the, the, the turbines built by uh, IRTA and subsequently the Department of Energy, uh, their research turbine inspired by the Smith-Putnam turbine. Uh, this was a Mod Zero. Uh, and there, was a, there was a couple of variants of this. Uh, uh, the first one is in Sandusky, uh, uh, Ohio. It could, it's a very interesting configuration. It could run either upwind or downwind. It had two blades. I think it actually was able to run with a single blade uh, in one of its configurations. Um, and so, and it's a lot of, it's a very interesting design. I think people learned a lot from it. Uh, then they went on to a larger machine, uh, the Mod 1, a two megawatt. A turbine uh, was put up in Boone, North Carolina, really too close to people without consideration, sufficient consideration of in, environmental issues and, 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 the, and the possible effect of noise. And it, it wasn't run for that long because of the noise issue. Uh, and that really was associated with the two blade operation downwind of the tower. Uh, so there's something I don't think that, 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 uh, that the Smith Putnam designers really gave any thought to. Uh, and then this was followed later on by uh, the Mod 2, uh, which was another uh, a turbine here in the U.S. in the 1980s. It also had steel blades like the, uh, um, like the Smith-Putnam turbine. Uh, it didn't have pitch control, but it had uh, uh, flaps that could, that could turn uh, for limiting the power. Uh, it had its own issues, uh, and this was succeeded by another one. I have a picture of it, the Mod 5B. Uh, was installed in Hawaii, uh, but um, things happened, and in many ways, these were not really uh, commercially successful uh, uh, designs. And so, so what happened really, as a um, sort of in the aftermath uh, of all of this, including the the work from the Department of Energy, is it is that wind energy reemerged uh, uh, with the ideas that. Uh, 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 the Putnam had had, namely uh, uh, grid-connected wind turbines, but these would be in farms uh, and arrays. Uh, and the, these, these large wind turbines were still difficult. It, it turns out that it's really not that easy to design a large wind turbine uh, and have it, have it work reliably over an extended period of time. And so there were arrays of, uh, rel of many relatively small turbines uh, and, and put in California uh, in the beginning at California wind farms. Uh, inspired by, uh, there were tax credits available, legislation, uh, favorable utility contracts, and uh, the governor of California in particular, uh, Jerry Brown was very supportive of, of wind energy and tried to make it happen. And that's in fact where it did happen. Uh, but these were much, much smaller turbines than the Smith Putnam turbine. Uh, uh, the first ones were on the order of 100 kilowatts as opposed to 1250, which is what the, uh, uh, what the Smith Putnam turbine was rated at. Uh, but uh, 
as a result of the of the wind farm experience, uh, first and foremost, that people learned a lot by by uh, operating uh, these smaller turbines and keeping them running and then de uh, designing them and redesigning them and improving them. Uh, the use of composites for the blades, uh, increasing availability, reliability of uh, electronics in, uh, for example, high power electronics uh, came online and, and, and uh, a computing power enabled people to, to really better understand uh, the engineering aspects of what you really need, needed to know uh, to design a turbine that would work uh, reliably in uh, wind conditions that were variable and and uh, and and whatnot. So that all these kind of combined to uh, over time to make uh, it possible to build more reliable, less costly, and a commercially viable turbine that were in fact far larger than uh, than the Smith Putnam turbine, which is uh, you know arguably that that was perhaps the 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 best lesson of the Danish approach is that they is their their turbine size grew slowly and they grew they went from something that worked maybe crudely but it, it kept working and they were able to uh to keep to keep advancing uh, their technology and so today uh uh turbines uh look the large turbines look like this this is a, a six megawatt uh a turbine um, uh, installed by a general electric um, off Block Island, uh, Rhode Island, uh, a few years ago, um, and as, so you see the blades that are, the blades relative to the swept area are, are quite slender. Uh, there, are, there are three blades in this case, uh, and uh, the the total weight of the turbine uh, per unit of power is considerably less uh, than than the Smith Putnam turbine uh, as well. So uh, just a brief summary here of of some of the a comparison between modern turbines and the Smith Putnam turbine, as I mentioned, that the size is uh, certainly of the utility scale turbines is is even larger, uh, considerably larger. Uh, the largest ones today are more than ten times as large on a on a on a megawatt uh, uh, basis, um, and they're lighter. They're the fewer tons per megawatt uh, of capacity, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, their power limitation is actually quite similar uh, in terms of the concept. Uh, the details are different, of course, but the, the the blade pitch angles are changed to limit the power or to help start up. The gearbox is is generally similar in concept, al although some turbines have low speed generators that, that don't actually have the gearbox, and there are pluses and minuses to that. They usually have three blades now. The configuration is upwind versus downwind. Typically, the blades are composites instead of steel. The generation in, invariably involves some power electronics, pretty sophisticated power electronics. Uh, the grid connection using the power electronics is, is conceptually similar, but it is more sophisticated. And the towers are generally a, a, a tube type shape rather than, than a truss, which uh, has a number of advantages as well as a, a cleaner look to it. So uh, that's um, essentially the summary I've, I'm, I've, I've, I've got here. I can answer any questions. If you want more information, uh, obviously you can go to the, the York County History Center. They have a tremendous amount of uh, information in all the archives. I think that pretty much exists from, uh, from this project, uh, the book. Uh, you can have your own copy. See, I have our own copy right here. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was reprinted. Uh, some years later, and uh, uh, a person named Paul Guype uh, operates a website uh, uh, called Windworks uh, and has a lot of the photographs that, that I showed are uh, available on that uh, website that you can, you can download. Them. There's a lot of good material there. So uh, without further ado, I can uh, stop sharing and ask if, if there's any questions. I am happy to, to see if I can answer them. Thank you so much, Professor Manuel. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, although there's a, some interesting conversation going on. If you want to take a look, um, Paul Geip did mention that he that he knows of a grid connected wind turbine in Denmark in the 1920s. Aha. So, but if there's anything here you'd like to comment on um, or speak about. And if anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to type them in. A lot of thanks. 
I see we have we do have a we have a, a guest from uh, from Denmark who's uh, who's watching. That's kind of fun, and a number a number of uh, people I, I recognize from uh, uh, from uh, from my career uh, in, in wind energy. It's nice nice to see nice to see all of you. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of us who uh, kind of um, were involved in wind energy from the nineteen anytime nineteen seventies eighties and nineties. You know, all knew about uh, the the Smith Putnam turbine in some way, shape, or form, and it. Uh, we all thought about it uh, to some degree. You know, whether uh, whether all the lessons were, uh, you know, what we wanted them to have been. Uh, you can always look back. What the, what should the lessons uh, have been? And uh, you know, sometimes it's tough. You know, it's not. You know, what do they say about history? You know, those that ignore it are condemned to repeat it. But you know, sometimes when you look at it, you have to make sure you you take the right lessons from it. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, 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 Palmer Putnam did, did an amazing, and his team did an amazing, amazing thing, considering where they were. You know, what the state of knowledge was at the time, and that they were to pull it all off. But uh, you know, what what happened is that maybe some people believed too much that they, everything was right. You know, I think. Some things were right, but some things they, I, I think even they would have gone on with time and said, huh, maybe we could have done something differently, something that would have been more, you know, less expensive, more reliable and whatnot. Um, Jim, there seems to be a number of questions rolling in. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, can I, I can see some in my chat. Should I answer those or do you want to, do you want to uh, pick them and just. <laughs> well, um, how about uh, there's one that says, do you think the three bladed upwind design will still be the primary configuration in 20 years? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I love that question because, you know, I've got my own particular fascination with with two blades. Uh, at UMass, we ran a two bladed downwind turbine. Uh, it's kind of a problematic design, quite honestly, but we ran it, had a lot of experience. And, and so I have a certain kind of, I don't know if fondness is the right word, but uh, respect uh, for this design. Uh, but I also realize that there's a lot of challenges to, to, to make it right. And there's some real kind of fundamental engineering issues with two blades and downwind that, that need to be resolved. For offshore, uh, they are, they're still really an interesting idea. And especially as you try to get larger and larger, it gets harder and harder to have a upwind blade that might bend back and hit your tower. If you have a downwind blade, it can uh, it can bend away from the tower, just as the Smith Putnam's uh, turbine uh, uh, intended uh, uh, to, to do. So um, I, I'm quite intrigued with following uh, the the. Well, I'm intrigued with both. And they're not necessarily related, but both two blades and downwind have some interesting features that could come back. I think they're more likely to come back for offshore than on land. Uh, two blades seem to be inherently noisier uh, because they tend to run a higher speed. So on land, you know, p the noise issue is a big deal. Uh, offshore, uh, it's really not such an issue. So uh, it's a long answer to that question, but I'm still intrigued. It's it's a uh, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a good one. Um, what do you think is the most significant innovation from the Smith Putnam turbine? Well, I, uh, maybe the, the innovation was a conceptual innovation in that, uh, that large turbines in groups could make a lot, could make a large amount of electricity at a commercially uh, viable rates. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody really thought that. I, I'd have to see what they, what Denmark, people in Denmark were thinking in those days. But I think in terms of kind of large scale generation, I think that was a pretty innovative uh, thing. Uh, certainly the idea that you could make a large turbine. I mean, they did it, right? Whether or not it, it had a problem, they certainly did it. They made the by far the largest turbine in the world. And they showed that you could do it. And even if it took a while before maybe totally reliable ones uh, could be made, I think that was a tremendous innovation. Uh, they had a lot of good details involved uh, uh, with the pitch control. I, I, you know, I'd have to go back and look and see who had, 
who was using pitch control before then. Probably somebody was, but it was a pretty, that seemed to work pretty well as far as I can tell on that design. And now everybody, all turbines pretty much have pitch control. So um, I don't know, maybe that's, that's what I can think of at the moment. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A about the, um, how it was taken down and if there's anything, any foundations or any metal left up on the mountain. Well, that's interesting. I actually, when I was a graduate student, I, I, I went up there. I went up to see the site and to see if anything was there. And I didn't see much, but I did find a, a rusty piece of cable about, about this long, about two feet long. And I brought it home and I kept it behind my wood stove for years. And actually, I have to go find it. Uh, but uh, I didn't see much. And that was probably about 1977 or something. Uh, that, I, that I found the rusty metal. So I can't imagine that there's too much, uh, too much there. I believe there's a plaque uh, up there now, but um, there's a lot of fairly technical questions coming in. I don't know if you'd like to address any of those in particular. Um, well, there are some good ones here. I see uh, uh, Paul Guype telling me that somebody was writing about wind turbine arrays connected to the grids in the 20s. So that's an interesting observation. It is the case that there were a lot of visionaries, right? Uh, there were, I mean, for example, Honoff. I mean, he will talk about a vision, but in fact, uh, things were not very practical. A lot of these visions were pretty impractical at the time. So, um, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, so visions are good, but you know, uh, whether, but I think that maybe this Putnam was a little closer. He, he had something that if it, if they'd gone through the next generation, I think they might have actually had a raise of a raise of wind turbines. Um, let's see, are there others here? Uh, yes, there. Are, somebody mentions here that could I comment on? There is an international energy agency is, has a activity uh, looking at downwind uh, uh, rotors uh, today, uh, which I actually I was hoping to participate in, but then ran out of time, and. Uh, so, but there is a uh, there is a group, a serious group, looking at downwind uh, rotors today. Uh, again, they have. I won't get into the technical side, but they have some some intriguing advantages, uh, and they may come back. Uh, <laughs> there's some amusing uh, things here. Uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, reading my chat. Are there any other questions that you see? <laughs> uh, there's one about the, the Putnam, Smith Putnam. Was it, had it, did it have a fixed base or was it able to rotate at all? Oh, oh was it, could it be fixed or variable speed? Well, I think oh. um, rotate, was it able to rotate uh, the base? Oh, is it, well, let's see, there, there are two issues. One is the blade yeah. rotational speed. And when the blade, when the turbine is grit connected to the grid, it, it was exactly fixed speed. It, it couldn't vary its speed at all. Now, modern wind turbines, they all have variable speed pretty much because they have power electronics that to allow them to do that. In those days, you could not vary at all. Uh, in terms of the orientation, to, as the wind direction changed, they could change the, the, the orientation. Uh, that's called yaw. So as the wind direction change, you could, you could do that. Uh, I don't think that answered that question. Yes, I think. Uh, Any other question? Maybe there's more further up in my chat window. Let's um, see. Yeah, I'm looking as well. Um, oh, what was the cost of energy? Yeah, uh, that was an earlier turbine. What was it, uh, the, the cost of energy of the Smith Putnam turbine? They actually had some numbers in the back of the book. Uh, about the expected cost of energy and their projections. And they, they finally ended up at the end of the redesign phase uh, uh, with a cost of energy, which they said was then higher than the, what was commercially available or that you could purchase power for. They had some number. It actually wasn't so much higher. I was surprised. I don't remember off the top of my head just what it was. Uh, but it, it was not so far out of line. I was, I, again, I was surprised. Uh, 
so, you know, again, they, maybe they were being optimistic, uh, and I, who knows, and, and that was in 1948, they did that, so I, I really, I, you know, I, I can't, I can't say, but it was, uh, it was um, not that far away. I, I see another question here. Uh, what do I think of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Grawian and the one bladed turbines? Well, there was a turbine. Actually, there's more stories here. I mean, I got to run out of time. You're going to shut me down pretty soon. Uh, but the Germans, I, I, I sort of, I said nice things about Ulrich Hütter's design. Uh, he had composite blades, which were actually pretty nice uh, uh, advancement. And I, I think that's, they ended up in German, uh, uh, in Denmark eventually, that they, but they were actually a German innovation. But the, uh, but Hutter went on to advise the, the German government, I guess it was who built it, a, a turbine called the Graulian, uh, which stands for large wind turbine in, in German. And uh, it was also downwind and it was also large and maybe it was also too early and it also had some problems. Uh, and when Hutter was involved with it and it has a whole history, uh, just a kind of, kind of like the Smith Putnam turbine. And uh, you know, it left actually a bad taste in some people's mouths. Uh, and there's again a whole story about that one, uh, but again, it was an interesting turbine in its own right, and uh, Hutter was involved with it, as I said. There was also a single-bladed uh, turbine, or a couple of them, a number of them built in Germany, and some of them were pretty significant size. I, I got to visit one of them, uh, go up in it, and it, it was interesting. Uh, I thought it just looked like a, a two-bladed turbine that needed another blade. But uh, they, apparently they got a design awards uh, and looked good, except the fact that it was missing an, a blade. Uh, and, uh, but it has its own issues with imbalance, aerodynamic imbalance and whatnot. And, and nobody, I don't think has pursued the single bladed turbine maybe for the last 20 years. I really don't know when the last one uh, uh, went away, right? So. So I guess there's some other comments. I'm just looking to see if there are any other yeah. questions. Um, vertical, what about vertical axis turbines? Vertical axis, well, ver <laughs> <laughs> who, asked me, who asked me that? Uh, vertical axis. Oh, here's a, here's a comment about the Grawian, only operated for 400 hours before being blown up. Okay, the vertical axis turbines, they had, you know, there are a lot of people who made, uh, well, there was, a, there was a lot of interest for a while in vertical axis turbines. They took a variety of forms. Actually, Putnam looked at some vertical axis designs before deciding on, on what they went with. Um, there was one called the Darius uh, that has a kind of a uh, 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 shape like an egg beater. A number of them were built in the California wind farms. Um, they were interesting. I think nice to look at. They had uh, uh, fatigue problems. Uh, some people have looked at, that, at them in more detail and concluded that they are inver in, invariably you have more blade mass per unit of power output uh, than you do with a horizontal axis machine. So if the blade cost is relatively the same on a per weight, weight basis, then they'll always cost more. Uh, they're very hard to limit the power in high winds. Uh, I'm sure you can do it, and you know, clever people have have come up with interesting ways to do it. But uh, uh, but uh, at this moment in time, there's no. I don't believe there are any serious uh, manufacturers uh, of, of vertical axis turbines of any size. There are for small scale applications. Uh, they can be kind of intriguing, at least aesthetically interesting. You know, architects I think might like vertical axis uh, turbines. Uh, because if they're going to mount them on a building, which is another whole topic I don't want to get into, but some people like to mount turbines on buildings, small ones, and uh, I'm not going to comment whether they, they should or they shouldn't, but if they do, a vertical axis maybe looks more interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm looking at some other people I know are sending me comments. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll be happy to send you all the uh, the chat chat comments uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't see any. Uh, I don't see any more. Uh, uh, I see another comment. A wind company being optimistic about the cost of energy. This that would never happen. 
<laughs> so yes, I think a lot of companies have been optimistic. If you read their their advertising literature, sometime you can't believe that that uh, you know you can't believe that anybody doesn't have one. Uh, let's see. Here's some. If it weren't somebody asked me if it weren't for it being assignment, do I think I would have looked into this turbine? Uh, well, maybe not. I, I guess I, I learned about uh, um, the, the turbine, just it was a textbook in the course I took. So uh, what the other question, but how was the transport? Well, I think uh, everything was broken into, it was in, in, in components when it was bought up the mountain. The mountain, they had to build the, the access road up to the top of the mountain and uh, you know, they could only bring pieces of a certain size and weight up uh, kind of one at a time and then assemble it uh, as you saw up there. All right, if, uh, God, I'm getting more new messages here. Uh, X, somebody has vertical X flow company has vertical axis turbines, but yes, it's small. What else? Uh, once again, <laughs> there's a there's a story here. I I don't, hadn't heard this story. It says that the program, the wind, uh, the implication is that the, the UMass program might have started when he found the book and uh, for uh, Hieronymus the. The, the founder of the program here at UMass, but long before we had a center of any sort, he started, he found a book in a hotel in San Francisco on the way back from World War II. So the, the, the person, yeah, who started kind of wind energy and renewable energy at UMass was this uh, Navy captain, uh, uh, Hieronymus, William, William Hieronymus, who also had visions. He, his visions were right up there with Honef. Well, no, I think they were more pragmatic than Honus because he had been a naval architect and designer of, of, uh, of uh, well, submarines uh, subsequently uh, and had a lot of, a lot of naval experience. But uh, so I, I, I hadn't heard that story before. That's a great story. Uh, I love that story. So I'll, uh, I'll use it. I have to use it. He told you that. Interesting. I, I have to uh, give a, there's going to be a, a I think I can say this is going to be an award given uh, coming up named after uh, a Hieronymus uh, by the, uh, the Business Network for Offshore Wind Energy uh, next in a couple of weeks. And so I have to give a little overview of, of, of uh, our of our original founder. Uh, so I may add that story. That's a great, a great story that so he <laughs> did not know that. Good. All right. <laughs> Uh, I think that's about all, um, unless you have anything else to add, Jim. Um, well, I, I guess I guess I don't. I mean, I'm still uh, I, I guess I all have to say that this gave me a great excuse to, to reread, uh, reread the book. I've, I've I kept it on my shelves all these years and I show pictures of it to my class. Uh, when I talk about the history of wind energy and how we got to where we are today, and uh, say that you should, you know, you should never, never forget the past. Uh, don't try not to repeat the mistakes, at least, of the past, but to take advantages of, of, of the good things that were learned. So, uh, but at any rate, um, that was that was a, a great opportunity to, to look at the book again. Uh, all right. Well. Uh, well, thank you, all of the, my 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 audience. This is this is a great audience here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah, this is great. I I, I love the audience. I, I, this is this is lots of fun here. Uh, okay, but maybe I should just stop unless anybody else has anything else to uh, uh, anybody else to say here. Okay, then I'll just uh, sign off. And again, thank all of you for. Uh, uh, for uh, for joining and asking questions. Hey, thank you. So, bye bye. Bye bye.